artificial intelligence. Uh, this colloquium is a joint effort organized by the National Alliance for Artificial Intelligence, which is being coordinated by CIMAT in Mexico. The colloquium is also organized by the Mexican Society for Artificial Intelligence and the Mexican Academy of Computing, AMEXCOM. So we all came together because we thought that uh, now with the epidemics, it would be a, a good opportunity for connecting to the different research groups in Mexico and offering talks uh, to the internet. So that we decided to invite uh, those researchers uh, who have been advancing the state of the art on artificial intelligence. And so uh, one of the researchers that we contacted is Professor Müller, Professor Klaus Robert Müller. He has agreed to, to give the first, the first uh, uh, talk today for this uh, national colloquium, which is starting this day. And uh, so we are very glad that he accepted our invitation. Let me tell you something about uh, Professor Müller. Klaus Robert Müller uh, received a degree in mathematical physics and his PhD also from the University of Karlsruhe in Germany. He happens to be also uh, from Karlsruhe. And then he went to work as a postdoc fellow at the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft in Berlin, where he became also the leader of the Department for Intelligent Data Analysis from 95 to 2008. He has been a professor at the University of Potsdam and since 2006, he is the chair for machine learning at the Technical University in Berlin. He uh, has received uh, many different awards. I'm, go I'm going to mention only four. The 1999 National Prize for- This uh, meeting is being uh, recorded. Uh, in 2006, he uh, received the Alcatel Communication Award. In 2014, the Science Prize of Berlin, which is awarded by the uh, governing mayor of Berlin. And just three years ago, he received the Vodafone Innovation Award. He's a member of two uh, academies, the German National Academy of Sciences, the Leopoldina, and also uh, he's also a member of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy. He is also a distinguished professor at, uh, the, at Korea University in Seoul. So uh, Klaus has been working um, on many fields uh, over the years. He has been working on, in machine learning, deep learning, data analysis. He has been doing also many applications like uh, analysis of biomedical data. His brain computer interfaces are very famous in Germany and in, in the world. And more recently, he has been doing uh, something which uh, is, is very new, computational chemistry and uh, atomistic simulations using methods from machine learning. So that I think that uh, in his talk today, he will give us an overview on, on how these machine learning, te learning techniques have been advancing. And so without further ado, uh, we uh, come to the talk and I give you the floor, Klaus. Please give your talk. I, th I think he's muted. And thank you very much, uh, Raul, for your nice words. And thank you very much. It's a great honor um, to be the first speaker of this series. And I think this is a very good idea to connect people these days. Um, so um, while I am happy that currently I can be in Mexico in one minute, <laughs> um, you know, I look forward to, to coming and visiting when hopefully Corona and times are over. So today I will um, talk a bit about machine learning, uh, mainly for the sciences, and um, try to um, show you a new field that has been also emerging, which is explainable AI. So I will cover a lot of ground. And um, so coming ranging from understanding um, decisions in nonlinear learners and a method to do that and many applications. Um, so one, one point that I would like to make is that modern AI is actually able to learn something about the systems um, that, that, we are, uh, that we're trying to, to analyze and to actually gain new knowledge, um, really um, genuinely new knowledge. And that is actually a different aspect that has not been there before. Um, so I think 
you know, this is preaching to the choir, but I still um, tell a bit about the, the standard methods of machine learning. One would be kernel methods, and I was lucky to be among the first um, who have entered that field, uh, support vector machines, um, with Vladimir Wapnik, who was my mentor. Um, and um, I've been doing neural networks for almost 30 years, which makes me old and you see the gray hair. Um, and um, the, the standard thing is that you train either one um, and you do this by um, taking a lot of data, training your model, and you would like to get the predictions on unseen data to be very good. And this prediction of unseen data, data which you haven't trained, that's called the generalization error. Now, um, let me um, switch gears here. So assume that you have your best machine learning model, your favorite one, and um, this is very good and predicts great stuff. Um, so then the question is, and that is the question that, that always people ask, is so what is this learning machine doing? So why is it giving a certain prediction? And then they complain that these nonlinear learning machines, they are black boxes because you can't really uh, look inside what's happening. And, you know, that kind of criticism, I think, is um, not valid anymore. And I will show you how. And I will also uh, explain why explaining is a, quite a challenging thing. So, first of all, what do I mean by explaining? And I take a simple example, which is maybe a bit silly, but it's coming from computer vision. Assume that you have trained your, your best possible uh, network, and this network is really great in recognizing roosters and distinguishing them from cars and, and parties and boats and whatnot. So this is like a standard computer vision program. Um, and what you do is you have now your deep learning model or your SVM, and your model on unseen data predicts um, the label of the image. In this case, the model will say it's a rooster because it's actually a rooster. And it will do this uh, because it generalizes well. But the question is, why on earth does this model that you have trained or somebody else has trained, why does it think that this is a rooster? And for this, you need to go backwards through the model, which is a nonlinear mathematical function, um, in order to attribute the reason for a certain decision to input variables. In this case, the input variables are pixels of the image, and therefore, um, we, I mean, it's very easy to see. So we can generate something which is called a heat map, which um, in this case, um, red, so hot means um, the model actually uses these type of pixels for, for the prediction and green means neutral. So um, I will in a minute explain how this is done and why this is difficult. But there was a really a change of um, a, a breakthrough discovery in, in 2015 by uh, my group, um, which you know, led to layer-wise relevance propagation with which you can actually explain single predictions for a model that has been tracked. So you can see, by the way, that this model um, that is a very good computer vision model um, is actually focusing on the, um, uh, on the rooster's hat, the rooster's comb, and which makes some sense. So let me just explain why this is difficult. So if you have a linear classifier, say, you know, we now have this classical iris data set. You have three classes and with different um, iris types. And there's a sepal, which is this leaf, leaf thing. And the sepal has a, a certain length or a certain width. And now I plot this in, in this two-dimensional space just to, to you know, show you um, the different um, iris types. So if you would take a linear model um, that classifies, say, between the um, setosa and, and the others, 
um, then it's 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 rather clear um, how you can explain this this classification because anything that is orthogonal to the classification line would be the variable or variables that um, explain um, this decision. So linear uh, classification is super easy to explain. In the case of non-linear classification, it's actually not so easy to explain as you can see in this plot. So um, because at different points of the classification surface, basically different aspects are important. In one case, it's just the length. In the other case, it's the width. And in, in the third case, it's both. So which makes it very hard. Um, so now you could get the impression that you can explain this locally, which may be um, working in this case, but um, in general, um, it, there are long range uh, correlations and it's better to have a global one. So that's a mathematical challenge. And the other thing that I would like to mention is um, if you actually um, classify, let's uh, say you classify different boats, then um, it's important to actually explain every single decision, um, at least for some uh, problems. So most of you may be familiar with the feature selection task where you have you know, a bunch of data belonging to one class and you're asking, what are the joint features that make this class, you know, the boat class? Um, so that's an ensemble view of things, but I'm now looking at the single decision, which is a different view. And um, you can see, um, if I do this heat map algorithm for this um, boat, which also, you know, is correctly classified by some classifier as a boat, um, you can see it's it's really the wheelhouse that makes this boat a boat in the in the eyes of the classifier. This one is a completely different boat. It's a sailboat, and it's really the sails that that uh, you know uh, make this boat look like um, like a like a boat. And this one is not even in water, so you know you can see the characteristic bow that is considered as as meaningful for classifying this as a uh, as a boat. So if you would now think about the important features of the whole ensemble of boats instead of the single ones, then um, this would be a heat map of all the joint features of all the classes. And basically, the only thing that you can read from this is that usually if you take a picture of a boat, the boat is in the middle of the picture. So it's not really helpful. So of course, sometimes you have these feature selection questions and sometimes you want to look at the individual uh, predictions. If, you, if you're in the medical domain, it's very clear that as a patient, you don't care about all the other patients. You would like to have the diagnosis about yourself. Um, if you're the FDA, um, then it's more important about the ensemble of all patients. So these two different views are both important and you have to see what kind of uh, problem you have. So, so with the new methods, we are actually able to look into the black box MN. And there has been a history of, of different explanation methods. And um, this is one snapshot of it. And this is a book, which is a bit more detailed on the snapshot, which appeared last year. Um, and let me just give you some formulas. And um, so just to be a bit more precise. So if you ask for an explanation, so f of x is what the classifier gives you, um, then you would like to know which pixels contribute how much to the classification. And these would be marked uh, in hot or um, uh, colors um, in the heat map. So in other words, you, you ask what makes this image to be classified as a car. Um, if you do something that is very uh, common and has been common in the in the even last century for control engineers, which is the sensitivity analysis, then you you fiddle with the variables and you change them and you look at gradients of the um, nonlinear function, and then you ask 
which change of variables, in this case pixels, lead to an increase or decrease of the prediction score. So in other words, the question that you're asking is what makes this image to be classified more or less a car, not a car in general. So these are different um, questions to be asked. And finally, um, um, the deconvolution approach would uh, match the input uh, pattern for the classified object in the image. So there's no formula that you can easily um, say. So depending on what kind of problem you would like to solve, um, in you know either of these methods is appropriate, but typically people don't think about this. Okay, let me just be a bit more detailed. So assume that you take a neural net and you do a classifier. Um, so this neural net is fully trained, so all the weights are fixed, um, and so you put in a new data point um, in the first layer, and then the network gives you some classification result. Um, by transforming and uh, rotating and squeezing and squashing um, the picture when you go from layer to layer. If you have many layers, then it's called a deep network. So in this case, the network says it's a ladybug because it's a ladybug. So now the question is, how do you go backwards through this nonlinearity? And I'll show you an algorithm that we called layer-wise relevance propagation. With this, we start and we take the output of the network of the forward pass as an initialization for what we call relevances. So um, then the next step is we would like to compute the relevance um, more downstream. And for this, we take the activities of the upper layer and the weights that are fixed because this is a trained network. And then we also take the activity from the first that's in red from the forward pass. And then we uh, compute the formula, which is just basically, um, it's like a backward pass, um, which looks a bit different though. Um, and you can now, once you have the, the middle layer's relevances, then you can go to the next layer and the next layer until you're at the, at the um, starting point for the input features. And so <clears throat> the interesting thing is that from this, you can actually prove that this does something like a Taylor expansion, but that we call this a deep Taylor expansion. So in other words, this algorithm does something meaningful in the mathematical sense. So there's one aspect that we also need to consider, which is that we need to conserve the relevance. So in every layer, um, the relevance should be uh, constant. So, so the relevance should not grow and it should not become smaller as we go backwards through the network towards the input. So that's a well normalized and calibrated thing. So then, of course, um, you can, look at what uh, the explanations are. And um, I mean, I'm aware that you should not uh, give a talk without showing cat pictures. Um, so here, um, just to, to see the support vector machine, you know, has different feelings about the different cats. It always gets them as cats, but sometimes it's the mustache, sometimes the fluffy bit in the, in the hair and so on and so forth. So these things make sense. You know, in the case of the neural network, and this is like AlexNet, um, you know, AlexNet thinks that this is coffee because of the crema or a very poisonous spider because of this dot or, you know, a cat because of the fluffy parts of the, of the, at the legs. So you can see, you know, with, with most um, neural networks and machine learning architectures, you can actually uh, apply these methods. Um, so now let's let's digest a bit. So um, just to you know reiterate this point, sensitivity tells you something about the gradients. This layer-wise relevance propagation does decompose um, the decision function with a deep Taylor expansion. So these are different uh, altogether. So I, I show this here at the um, picture for which is classified 
to be in the scooter class because of, there's a bunch of scooters on this picture. And then the sensitivity analysis shows you a heat map which has a lot of um, activity, for example, on the street, which you know makes you wonder why is that? And as I said, it's about the sensitivity measures. If I change these pixels, does it become more or less a scooter in this case? So of course, if you change the pixels on the street, then you know maybe in the end you will get a scooter. So that is uh, you know what the sensitivity do, does give you. Also, the sensitivity analysis has a problem with deeper architecture, and there's a gradient shattering effect that is an interesting one. In the case of LRP, it's different. We have um, um, the wheels as as um, um, important aspects or the lights of the of the scooters and so on. So you can you can see that these are really significantly different um, uh, approaches. And there's also another point, which is um, this AOS relevance publication can say positive and negative things. So assume that I classify this image as a three, then of course I can I can ask the model, why did you classify this as a three? And then you have this, this activity telling you, okay, there's no stroke here between, um, you know, at the three. Um, and so that's, you know, why it's not a nine or something. And also there's um, some stroke um, in the middle, which makes it a three. But you can also say, um, you know, what would make that's the right picture what would make the class classified as a nine and clearly in this case you also the lrp tells you it is not a nine because this stroke is not finished um so so you can see uh, that you know the the classification tells you this is not a nine and it should have something to make it a nine, okay? Um, so now we can apply this in all sorts of contexts. Um, and, you know, this is, a, you know, an interesting exercise. So there's a benchmark where there's a lot of pictures of people and their ages. And so this picture is considered more on the old side of things. And you can ask, why does this classifier um, consider this picture as more on the older side? And it's really the earlobe and the, the region around the eyes that, that make this, uh, this person look older. And um, when, <clears throat> when studying this, um, we got some really fun and strange effect. And this was the following. So <clears throat> there were some elder people who were classified systematically to be younger. So we wondered what is happening there. And then we looked at these pictures retrospectively. And the reason why our model considered um, the pictures as younger was because they had a bright smile on their face. So this was actually uh, quite interesting to see because the database that considered the faces of old and young people had the old people mostly with a very serious look, no smile. So um, everything, and but all the young people somehow smiled on this database. So it's an artifact in the database and um, which, you know, had the model conclude that if you're smiling, you're younger. And practically um, also maybe human judgment is similar. So, so if you smile, then, then uh, people take you to be younger. So this is my take home in this, in this context. But also you can see bugs in the data set. Um, you know, also you can, you know, in modern times where you have fairness and trustworthiness in, in um, um, machine learning, it's a very good way of detecting whether or not there's something wrong with your data set. Of course, you can also apply this to other things than, than uh, 
uh, images or video, for example, you can apply it to text and you can see which, you know, these uh, three, three classes and the same text. And um, um, if you would classify this text into um, a space uh, thing, then the astronauts and NASA and Earth would be the most salient things. Um, if it's motorcycle, then ride would be very uh, salient. And if it's medical, if it's discomfort and body and sickness, that would be very salient. So you can see that that it's not only limited to images, but you can basically put in everything what you want. Um, now, let me see what we can now do with this technique. And let me just, you know, again, step back a bit, because we are all very um, enthusiastic about AI, and sometimes we have to think about the limits of AI um, and about our, the limits of our models. So I just, in the second slide, explained the standard model of machine learning, which is you learn from data and you try to get your predictions well on unseen data. So your generalization error should be um, a low one. And, and all what machine learning does is try to, to get this implemented so that you really on unseen data, you, your predictions are good. So the question now is, is this generalization error actually all that we need? In some sense, yes, but you will, um, you know, experience that maybe it's not all. So this is a standard exercise in computer vision uh, where you have two models and you compare their performance um, on the test set for various classes. And you can see, you know, in this case, this is a deep network or the Fisher uh, method, which is also quite popular in computer vision. And you can see, um, you know, the deep net is much better um, than, than the Fisher for birds. But for example, for horses, it looks pretty much the same. And um, both of them generalize well. So, um, you know, from that figure, we conclude that both models are excellent in predicting horses. And um, now we can actually have a, have a new technique for, for studying uh, what these models actually do in order to, um, exp you know, to classify these horses. So here's um, a picture that we have that we put in. Both models have never seen it. And both models clearly say it's a horse. And the reasons couldn't be different. So the deep neural network basically looks a bit to the horse's butt, the horse's nose, and a bit to the rider. That's it. it they, they look fully at the object. Now, Fisher also looks a bit to the horse's butt, but looks very much into the lower left corner of the image. And, uh, you know, to the best of my knowledge, there's no horse in this lower left corner. But if we really look very closely to, um, to this picture, we see, and I read it to you, um, um, some text which says Lothar Lenz Pferdefoto Archiv DE. So it's a copyright tag, which basically says that this is a horse picture. And um, now <clears throat> I, I should say a bit more about this data set. This data set was a, for a decade a standard benchmark for computer vision, for all of computer vision. No, but it's, a, it's a large benchmark. So nobody goes around and looks at all the pictures. Everybody only reports the generalization ability. So in other words, you know, everybody will say, you know, both classifiers are exactly, you know, similarly qualified. And they indeed both you know, classify this as, a, as, a, as horses. But one for, you know, a silly reason, it basically cheating, well, I mean, being, so to say, more like a smart ass, looking at um, a, a hint, which is, has nothing to do with horses. So I would like to, you know, use this example 
to talk about another horse. So this is horse is a classic horse. It's called Hans. It was a Berlin horse, and um, it was called Clever Hans. And um, you know this was uh, beginning of the of um, 1904 or so. But um, you know this was a riot. Everybody was talking about it because this horse could allegedly do math. So the horse got some math ex exercise, and then the horse had to give the answer to some very elementary algebra. And it would knock with his um, foot to the, um, to the wood. And so the horse always got it right. So the horse was not making mistakes. And everybody thought, gee, horses can do math. And then somebody came along and said, this can't be true. We know that horses can't do math. And um, then they found out that the horse was just very attentive to his master or any human that was actually asking this question. So the horse was giving the right answer for the wrong reason. It was not doing math. It was just you know, giving the right answer because of the human. So for this reason, I would call the uh, Fischer vector um, strategy um, a clever Hans strategy in solving for solving the problem. And if we think about something more serious than um, uh, classifying horses, in fact, uh, you know, for example, diagnosing cancer or something, you know, which is more a life or death thing, it's clear from which model I would like to be um, diagnosed. I wouldn't want this model to have any clever Hans feelings. Okay, so. Um, this can be scaled. Um, so, uh, you know, in order to distinguish or to find um, the possible strategies of a model um, solving a problem, we came um, to the following algorithm, which is called SPRAY, Spectral Relevance Analysis. So imagine you have your classifier, it's, it's trained, so then you put some data inside, some new data, and that it will give some prediction. And then you go backwards in linear time with the heat map mapping algorithm, and you get a bunch of heat maps. And then you normalize them appropriately, and then you could cluster them. And um, you know if there are several clusters in this, a spectral clustering approach will um, give you an um, eigenvalue gap. Uh, which tells you that there are more than one cluster. And then, you know, you can actually take prototypes from these clusters and eyeball them. So here we would have um, the um, copyright tag strategy on um, portrait fo uh, format, and this is on landscape format. This is uh, the clever hunt strategy, but, you know, using context, namely, um, hurdles, because you know that's the context of where horses are, and this is like the standard strategy that we may want to have is classifying a horse because there's a horse. Um, so um, let's so just to to make you know a lot of people you know made some criticism say said well you know Fisher and you know this this. Um, old Alex net that you analyzed, this is not the state of the art, but we did use state of the art models on very large data sets like ImageNet. And people would say, well, there are no clever answers there. But you know, we can automatize this whole procedure for very large data sets. And then we can also find funny uh, things. For example, this is the airplane class, and obviously there are two strategies of solving it. The more interesting strategy because it's clever hunt, is this one here. And I'll show you the heat maps and the respective photos of the heat maps. So you can see these are airplanes. And you know, usually if you classify an airplane, you would like to have the heat map cover the space where the plane is, right? But you can see the heat map is basically on the edge of the picture. And you ask yourself, why is that? Um, so in computer vision, people do cropping. If they collect their data sets, 
you know, not all data, um, all images are the same format. You would put them to the same format by putting some um, randomness towards the edge in order to get the same size. That's called cropping. The same algorithm has been used for several decades. But it turns out that this algorithm is giving a tell to the model. And therefore, the model focuses on this edge and provided by the cropping algorithm. So if we actually change the cropping algorithm to something you know, statistically more meaningful, um, the, the um, edge effect goes away. And we actually get a better classification rate out of sample for the image. So it doesn't only show that we can detect issues in the data set. It also allows us to reason about them, to, to fix them, and to improve our model. So talking about gaining insight, um, let's, let's, so now we have you know, wonderful deep learning models. Um, and we have a way to look what they're doing. Um, so, and um, so we start with um, complex gaming scenarios. Our friends at DeepMind, they have been um, analyzing Atari games or arcade games. And um, they, they had a very beautiful paper um, showing that the um, deep learning models could really excel at the quality in which they can play these games. Now we can ask, are these models, have, have they learned something meaningful about the games? Um, or are they perhaps also using some clever hunt strategies? And here's breakout. Um, and you can, we can uh, just look at it. So by the way, the left side is sensitivity analysis that doesn't tell you much. The right side is layer-wise relevance propagation. So you can see a clear focus on the ball. So this is what the network pays attention to. And there's a focus on the um, um, sites where, where tunnels will emerge. And now the network is already looking at um, the, the bottom part. So that's the most important uh, thing why, why the network plays in, the, in this particular way. So you can see um, actually what is the strategy with which um, the, this very good uh, breakout playing network, how, how it judges um, you know, this game and the game position. Interesting is that um, you know, a similarly well-playing network is also in another arcade game, which is the pinball game. And in the pinball game, essentially, the only thing that this network has learned is to nudge the table. <laughs> so that's a clear clever hunt strategy, I would say. It's not a bad one. So um, in these arcade games, the, the level or the threshold of, of nudging is, is uh, uh, you know, a bit high and then, so the network is, is clearly making use of that. It's not a bad strategy, it's a very intelligent one. So um, let's now move forward to the sciences. Um, and one aspect um, that already Raul um, mentioned in the introduction was, was uh, my uh, favorite use of machine learning in the sciences, which is, uh, um, and talking about the Schrodinger equation. So um, here you see Schrodinger's face and next to him, you see the Schrodinger equation. So there's the Hamiltonian, the wave function, and E is the energy. So you can see for uh, some atoms or mo molecules or material, this just describes the quantum mechanical properties of this um, molecule or whatever. So the problem in this innocently looking equation, it's really a tough one. Um, because you know, if you, if you would naively solve it, then even for a small molecule, you would have to solve some, inver uh, sol solve some inversion problem of a 10 to the 60 dimensional thing. This is why people 
have come up with approximations to the Schrodinger equation. And so for a small molecule, you take with a decent approximation, you take about one to five hours of computing time with a more accurate one, you would take seven hours of computing time per molecule to get the quantum mechanical properties. So the, the um, technique that was developed uh, that made many uh, chemists happy was called density functional theory and got some Nobel prizes. So I, it, there was a um, workshop at IPAM, Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematic, uh, Mathematics at UCLA, where I actually um, you know, attended and it was a bunch of chemists and I was the only machine learning dude. And after a while, um, but I have a quantum mechanics training. So after a while, I, I thought, why not put whatever goes into the Schrodinger equation? So the nuclear charges and the coordinates of the uh, uh, atoms of a molecule, say, and take the data that we get from the quantum chemical simulation and learn a machine learning model to imitate um, this solution process. In other words, you know, we, we, we consider the solver of the Schrodinger equation or the approximate solver as a black box and try to mimic it with a machine learning system. So instead of um, solving the equation, we're just predicting the outcome of the equation. So people didn't really appreciate it much. <laughs> um, the the math mathematicians, they were furious because you should solve your equations and the physicists and chemists also didn't like it too much. And still we tried it. And we means um, um, Alex Kachenko, who is actually uh, Mexican, Russian, and um, Anatol von Lilienfeld, and um, also Matthias Rupp. And so um, how did we do this? So the first thing in machine learning is that you, um, you know, if you have this molecule, you try to represent it somehow because you need to compare things in machine learning. Um, so, so for every atom, we have the nuclear charge and its three its position in three D space, and then we uh, represent every molecule by a matrix um, with R i minus R j. That's the Coulomb force, and that's the um, nuclear charges up here. And then two molecules can be um, you know, seen similar or not similar by taking the Frobenius norm distance. So with that, we can get the distance between two molecules. And then we can put it into a um, Gaussian kernel matrix and do kernel rate regression, which was the silliest thing that we could do from the machine learning perspective. But if it would, you know, if, if this doesn't work, then, you know, there's no use in trying, um, you know, deep learn. So, this actually worked very well, and we can um, um, solve the um, current ridge regression problem by a matrix inversion. So it takes uh, fractions of a uh, millisecond, um, and then then you know you have the parameters, and you have a prediction model where a new molecule can come in, and the MIs they are in your training set. These are the model uh, molecules in your training set. And so what we did was. Um, in 2012, we published this, this first um, paper on that uh, field where we showed that, um, you know, given say a thousand data points um, that from which we learn, we can uh, predict out of sample at a quality which is about 10 K cal per mole. Now for the non-chemists of you um, or for the chemists of you, well, this is, not such a great result, but it's not bad. <laughs> so if you would take a mean predictor, it would be something like 300 k cal. So it did learn something. But in the same year, we had a NeurIPS paper, um, and we were at 3 k cal per mole. And then in 2015, we were already at 1 k, 1.3 k cal per mole. But notably, we are not taking hours for the computation of every a molecule, but we take fractions of a millisecond. So we're about 10 million times faster. 
and um, we're quite accurate. In fact, you know, we are um, now below one kcal per mole, which is what makes chemists really happy. Um, and, you know, there's a model that they are essentially um, convolutive neural networks or graph neural networks that one can use. And so there's two architectures, the deep Taylor uh, neuron, uh, it, deep tensor neural network and the Schnett, um, um, which can go up to uh, 0.3 k per mole out of sample. Now we can ask ourselves, is this kind of model that we're using um, in to order to predict the outcome of the Schrodinger equation, is this actually doing some nonsensical clever hunts thing? And so we now have the techniques to, to try to understand this. And um, so, so basically, if we you know, put in a benzene molecule um, and we would pretend to be a hydrogen, um, we can now see how the model feels about a hydrogen to be put somewhere. So in other words, there's a, some local chemical potential, and I put the quotes here, um, where we can see that the hydrogen would rather go to the middle, but you know there are some points that it likes and some that doesn't. And same for carbon on, and other things. So we have all these, we call them gummy bear plots, which tell us how the network thinks about um, the local chemical potentials and um, they do make sense for the chemists. So moreover, um, we could um, also query um, the molecule about some um, you know, more complex properties. So for example, if you think about all the molecules that have an aromatic ring with some groups dangling about this aromatic ring, you could ask which are the most stable of them. And this is already in your database because that's the energy of the molecule. But you could say um, which of them have the most stable aromatic ring in there, which is you know, some information that is not in the database, but that could you know, be analyzed by our model. And so then we can get some new insights that, that were not in the training data or in the test data. And so that's quite interesting because it's a starting point of, of understanding things more. And um, here you can see that we can also do this for materials. In the case of materials, in fact, the computation times are, uh, you know, more like uh, a couple, I mean, one, two, three months per material. Um, so this is really, really, um, you know, much faster and with, with some good results, not as good as for molecules though. So let me just change gears. Um, and talk about machine learning in the neurosciences. And um, I already mentioned the brain-computer interface. And um, the idea of the brain-computer interface is that you have, you're measuring brain signals, and then you have the computer translate these brain signals into um, control signals. So just to, to demonstrate this, um, in this case, we will have we will watch the game of Pong, where the subject, in this case, you, this is actually me some years ago. <laughs> um, the subject is thinking about his right or left hand. So it's the subject will not be moving these, these hands. And um, when I actually imagine moving my hand like a, squeezing a ball, or I could imagine also kicking a ball if, if I was more into soccer. And um, then, you know, when I squeeze my right hand, then on my left hemisphere, there will be some motor activity being suppressed. Left hand, right hemisphere. So there's in different parts of the brain, there will be some oscillations that will be suppressed. That's so to say the lead for us and our 
machine learning model will try to find this out. And when we started in the field, um, the typically the subjects or the patients had to train for several hundred hours um, in order um, to have their, their thoughts be decoded. So this is in particular um, important for patients that, that are heavily sick, that have no other way of communicating. But we, using machine learning, we had, you know, we, we didn't need to wait until the subjects' brains have, have adapted to some, um, you know, suboptimal decoder, but we could learn what the patients think and then decode that. So um, overall, we could reduce um, the training time to something like five minutes, which made this whole technology immediately um, usable. And in the beginning, when we started, there were about 10, 20 groups in the world, mainly from the medical field. And now I think there's four or 500 people, uh, groups in the world who, who study this. So the applications of this are, um, of course, help or hope for uh, patients that have ALS or stroke. Um, so we could show that using brain computer interface training, you can actually um, make the brain plastic. So, um, you know, in, within very short times. So this was last year's paper. We can use this as a new tool of studying neuroscience and of asking some, you know, doing some experiments over like the Libet experiments and others. And perhaps the most unforeseen type of uh, experiments, um, which you wouldn't think of, were in, in the context of video coding. So the story is um, my colleague, uh, Thomas Wiegand, who is the father of H264, um, or one of the fathers of H264, he's a professor at TU Berlin. And um, we walked along the Spree and one um, you know, after lunch at some point. And um, we were thinking about some, some you know, crazy project that we could um, propose uh, in, in one of the excellence initiatives uh, that Germany had. And then the idea was to say, well, in the case of um, MP3, people have done a lot of um, activity to understand what the brain perceives or not. How about understanding this also for videos? And then Thomas said, yeah, that's a good idea. How will we do that? And I said, well, we use a brain computer interface. <laughs> and then he said, you're nuts, let's do it. And um, of course, the reviewers of our proposal also thought that we were nuts and rejected that part. Um, but, you know, over some years, we, we actually pursued this and we could, you know, understand how the brain reacts to different textures and um, different parts of an image, you know, what, how many bits you need to put in there. And um, some three or four years ago, um, they... Um, you know, and, and, and that insight then was, was put into the new engineering, engineered code um, and um, could get some, uh, could knock some 10, 15% off the bits that you have to transmit. So, so Thomas told me that the, the amount of, of uh, energy put into video coding these days is, is uh, I think something like 300 nuclear power plants. So um, taking off 10% is quite substantial. So I wouldn't have thought that neuroscience can give this kind of contribution. But this is, comes on top of you know, all the great developments that video coding people actually have. Um, so because it comes from a different um, viewpoint. So let me, uh, and this is the explanation that we get from the models that we are using to decode. So let me um, spend the last six minutes of my talk in, in some, um, yeah, more recent um, 
you know, papers. In fact, they both appeared this month. And um, this is very crazy. So <clears throat> some of you may know scanning probe microscopes. Um, so this is a scanning probe microscope. And what people have done with it is they take little atoms from a surface and um, put the atoms somewhere. And so then in this sense, they could write, for example, Jülich, because it, you were working together with our colleagues in Jülich. And so this is fantastic technology. And if you want to think about nanofabrication, then um, you know, it, it would be helpful to actually not having to move single atoms, but rather larger molecules. So molecules with which you can you know, build, so to say, card houses or just larger structures. Now, the problem in this is that if you think about these molecules lying on a surface, and this is a silver surface, and these are, you know, larger molecules. The reds are the oxygens, uh, the blues carbon, and um, the, uh, the gray ones are hydrogens. So, so the idea would be that instead of using the microscope to see quantum mechanically what is happening there on the surface, we actually, um, you know, take the microscope to to lift up the um, respective um, molecule. So the, the microscope has a one atom tip and this can, you know, take a oxygen of the molecule and then try pulling. Now you could, you know, take a force feedback and have a human do this. If you do that, um, then, you know, the human after a while may be able to pull up um, two or three out of 50 trials. So this is very difficult. It's, it's like removing a Band-Aid, but the, this, this molecule sticks to the surface because of quantum mechanics. So it's really, really um, complicated to simulate. So, so in, in fact, it's impossible to simulate properly. So the only data that you have are, is experimental data. So then we came to the conclusion that the best possible model that we can use is taking reinforcement learning and have the um, scanning probe microscope do some little exploration tests of this molecule and um, then try to pull it up. Um, we give the model a bit of physics background, but uh, it's uh, so, so that if we pull too much, then this falls off. And also the tip changes. So it's a highly non-stationary thing. But you know, with the reinforcement learning algorithm, we could you know get to, get this to something like forty-eight out of fifty um, times that we can pull up. So this is quite remarkable, and that's the third, the first. I mean, it's an autonomous way of of pulling out these molecules. And so it's very hard because you have very little data. You cannot properly simulate this. Um, it's, it's, you know, the quantum mechanics is, of this is excruciatingly slow. Um, so I'll, I'll just show you a video. Okay. So you can see that it can now remove a molecule. And with this, you know, molecule, you can start to play, to play card houses. Next one <laughs> is um, what went, um, you know, viral, I think, the last days. Um, on the 23rd of um, September, we got a paper published in Science Robotics, and it's about our curling robot. Um, and so the idea there is you have a, a robot that um, um, curls and you, you, the robot um, basically has to solve uh, a bunch of very difficult tasks, namely 
the robot has to play uh, to plan its move in order to um, beat the, the opponent team. So it's a bit like in Go, except that um, you know we have a continuous space. Um, so it's a very hard strategic game on one side. On the other side, throwing uh, a stone is quite uh, a, an issue, and we can use simulation for throwing a stone, but the simulations are far from from the reality. So, so typically the uncertainty of the outcome, if we would follow the simulation, uh, would be something like three meters, uh, not enough to win. Um, so we have to train a neural network model to compensate the, uh, these uncertain uh, outcomes and the, the gap between the simulation and, and the reality. And then we need to put this uncertainty, we need to factor in this uncertainty into the, the planning process. So the, the problems that we have are high uncertainty, it's super non-stationary, so the ice changes with every throw, and it changes fundamentally, and we have these continuous spaces. And so um, we were quite um, happy that our, our robot actually um, played quite well. Um, oops, and I'm not sure whether this somehow the video doesn't work. So I will, ah, okay, now, now it does work. Um, so this is Korean. And this is the curling robot. Now the curling robot looks at the playground and looks where the opponent's stones are, then plans, you know, the trajectory, and compensates the tra I mean, for for the um, uncertainties in this, and then uh, you know pulls in the camera, and starts rotating the stone in the appropriate direction, and then accelerates. Um, in order um, to throw the stone. And the, you know, at the red line, the hog line, you need to release. And uh, then you know, the stone takes a long way um, and then it kicks out the opponent's stone. So if you if you are interested in, in this curling, and these are this is a high school team, it's the best in Korea, but we also played against national teams. So um, in the tournament games against national teams, we were um, winning three against one. So it's a so our robot does something nice, and so you can see full videos of games so that you can see that it's not some you know cherry picked thing. Okay, um, so again, the the real challenge here was um, oops, uh, I have to. Now move to the next slide. I don't know how to do this. Ah. Right. Ah, okay, good. So, so the hard part of this, um, you know, curling um, um, collaboration. Um, you know, this was a big uh, collaboration that you know gener uh, that manufactured this robot, and my colleagues. Um, Domok Won and Song Wang Lee, they were the co-authors of this paper. And the, the tough part, and this is what the paper is about, is how to deal with the uh, non-stationarity, with the uncertainty in the planning, and with the little data. Um, so let me um, start concluding. So I believe that explaining and interpreting nonlinear models is essential. It's essential if you want to use it for something like uh, the sciences or medicine, uh, because we need to understand what these models are doing, and we need to understand that they're not doing clever hunts. Um, so it's orthogonal to improving neural network models. Um, you know, you can improve your neural network model as much as you want. Um, on top of this, you can always explain. All these methods work for, for any models that you can think of, um, at least so far. Um, then there's a theory behind this, and it's a wonderful tool to gain insight. And just to, to do some advertisement, 
Um, in Berlin, we, we have two centers, the big data center and the machine learning center that are now have moved together. And our mission is to actually uh, go towards, you know, very scalable um, uh, machine learning um, models and scalable um, database management that takes machine learning into account in, in the way the database management systems are constructed. So you can find um, more information on the heat mapping page. There's code that you can use and there's different um, tutorials and, and material. And of course you can um, you know, get, go to my homepage and get papers on, on everything that I showed. Thank you very much. It was really a pleasure. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you. It was a wonderful talk. Now, if you could um, disconnect your your representation, we can go yes. to the questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have actually several questions, and I will start with the chemistry questions because that was mm -hmm. the last part of the talk. Mm -hmm. So here is a very technical question for me, maybe not for you. Regarding the Coulomb mat matrix, can we expect a better result using, for example, a Lenard Jones potential instead of a Columbic one? Yes, very good question. So um, practically, I showed the Coulomb matrix because it was a starting point. And they, you know, for since 2012, for about six years at least, um, there was a race for getting the best descriptors. And you know, we we also had have done some some work where we actually compare um, you know different descriptors and also um, you know also compare to using Leonard Jones potentials and so, so on. So this is a very valid question. And just allow me to say one more thing. So if you take a kernel method like I showed, because in the interest of time, this was um, you know the easiest to explain. And um, you know you have to form, formally say what are the features in this case the Coulomb matrix or other things that you can think of. There's a zoo of these. Now, if you take a neural network, the neural network will try to learn, you know, in the same idea as in word to vec, what is so to say the role of a certain atom in its chemical context. So, um, and this is why the neural network models are often better um, because it, you know, they, they make sure that they can um, build sophisticated uh, um, feature representation from the data that you're looking at. Okay. So there is another question also about uh, chemistry. Uh, mm -hmm. This is from Andres Garcia Medina. So mm -hmm. when you talk about the uh, interactions model by the Schrodinger equation, what's the learning model really capturing uh, from the Schrodinger equation in the applications or in the projects that you describe? Yes. Um, so so you know I only had the, the possibility to look at to to discuss one point, um, which was uh, you know just predicting quantum chemical properties. Um, in fact. You know, a lot of the work that we've done, which I left out, is on molecular dynamics using uh, machine learning. And there we could mm, um, we could do molecular dynamics at a couple cluster level, um, CCSDT level, um, for uh, molecules like aspirin or paracetamol, which allowed us to get very new insights into, um, you know, what what can be learned about these these molecules? So um, I think I mean so if you if you're interested in reading that there's a, a recent um, Nature reviews in chemistry article that by Anatol von Lilienfeld, Alex Kachenko, and myself, which you know rolls out the whole you know field very nicely. So I, I recommend reading that. Also, there's a book, by the way, that was that appeared um, a few months ago, where we uh, collect, like in the explaining book, um, a snapshot of, of this emerging field. Okay. okay, 
Now let's move on to, to the heat maps. Mm -hmm. and, um, so there is here one question from Luis Enrique Zucker. Uh, regarding explanations, how about going beyond heat maps and provide textual explanations? So, uh, Excellent. Um, yeah, I mean, it's this this field is not very um, you know has not been there for very long time, so um, there's a it's an open question. Um, what is a good explanation format for whom? So um, this was in a 2010 paper where we studied whether explanations given by a machine learning model could um, get different um, levels of chemists um, perform better in, in knowing whether or not some molecule was toxic. So this was like just general students, um, chemistry students and chemistry professionals. And of course, <laughs> you know, depending on, you know, the level of skills that you have, um, you may have, want to have a different explanations. So there's some literature in the human machine uh, action um, uh, domain where people start following upon this, but this is a super important uh, question and I cannot properly answer it, but you're right, it is very important. Okay, so one more question about uh, the relevance propagation. Mm -hmm. So how do you compute the heat maps for the Fisher algorithm because for the neural network it is clear that you have the individual pixels but for the fissure well i think you can generally say um if you um to compute heat maps you can always i mean every um machine learning algorithm also fissure or kernel methods can be translated into a neural network and then you just use the st strategy for a neural network they are formally equivalent so we can I mean, in a later paper, we call this neuralization <laughs> because you basically um, translate everything into a neural network format, then you put it into the, the software and done, right? Okay. Okay, another question. Um, why do you say that uh, uh, that you have a Taylor expansion in your method? Ah, because okay, for the so Taylor expansion, you need uh, the, the, the first, the second, the third derivative. Yes. And here you only have back propagation or something. I, I, yes, yeah. very, very good question. And it tells me I was way too short on this one. <laughs> so um, it's also a bit technical, but I will try to do some hand waving. Okay. So imagine you have a decision surface. Okay. So it's clear that you can do a Taylor expansion to model this decision surface, which means that you have a first order term, but you also have higher order terms. In order to do a global Taylor expansion, you actually have, have, all, have to take all the terms, which is excruciatingly difficult to estimate. It's impossible, right? So what we found out and what we proved is the following. So assume, assume that you don't do a, this global Taylor expansion, which is not practical, but you do something that tries to approximate the global Taylor expansion. And with this, you need, you take the structure of your model. So, so if you think about the nonlinearities, um, then they are, you know, so this is the decision surface. And then, you know, the, the single units, they are oriented in a particular way whether they are um, sigmoid or, or radius, and, and then it's like a local linear approximation. The point is that this local linear approximation, um, if it's around the same root point, then it's just a local linear, it, then it's just a linear approximation of the Taylor. But if you do it around different root points, then you just do local linear patches and you can prove that this comes to the same conclusion as the global. Okay, we would That's have to the see the head waving <laughs> argument. <laughs> we would have to see the math. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a paper on this. So, yeah. um, uh, so, but it's a lengthy. <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, also in the same direction, um, could these methods improve the way that face recognition works? Well. Um, 
there's a debate on this, okay? <laughs> so um, some people say uh, all these explanation methods, we actually don't use, uh, we don't need them. The only thing that is important is the generalization error. I showed that this is not quite correct because you know it's very important to know about the strategy. If it's a clever hunt strategy, then you know in any kind of safety critical or serious application, you would not want to trust your life on this, right? So therefore, um, you know, I think it does contribute to improving these methods by understanding what methods do overfit. Are there problems in the data set that we can, you know, debug with? Um, can we, you know, be uh, more invariant and can we check this with explanations me methods? So it's it's like a tool with which you can look in the in the uh, in your network, and 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 so if you use this tool um, as a starting point for your improvement and to get insight on how you solve the problem or how your network solves the problem, I think. Um, there, there are several examples, and you know, if you look into those papers that that we've written, you can see them, where where you know things get better. So in the case that I made um, about the airplanes, <laughs> you know, just changing the cropping algorithm, um, you know, relieves the problem in the airplane cl class, and then you get a better classifier. Mm -hmm. So in the case of face recognition, of course, <laughs> if you think about age or um, things, um, in this case, it was clearly uh, an issue in the data set, you know, having two serious elderly people in there. <laughs> okay, thank you. So now moving on to, uh, to the um, EEG uh, processing. So there is one question here. Um, where is it? So, are sequence to sequence models using computer brain interfaces? SEQ to SEQ models? Yes, oh, that's, a, that's a good question. So, now I let me just um, um, say something that may be not so popular. Um, so, a lot of people these days are completely uh, you know, enthused by deep deep learning models, and for good reasons. I'm I'm also one of them. But if you solve uh, you know a practical a practical problem in the sciences or in some in industry, then then you need to consider what you have in your hands. So if you if you think about brain computer interfacing, you don't have many data points. You have a you know, a couple hundred at most per subject. Subjects are very different. Their brains are very different. So, you know, if you, the danger in, in taking very sophisticated models, and that was one, but it's a good one, it's an interesting one, is that you, you know, hopelessly overfit. And so that is an issue. If you can, you know, I mean, it's a, people have been, you know, doing digital pathology with few hundred images and still not overfitting. But it takes, you know, huge skills. You need to know what you're doing. So, so if, you, if you know what you're doing, then that's okay to use such a model. And it's, it may be very interesting. Okay. So now uh, question. So what's Elon Musk patenting regarding <laughs> brain computer interfaces? Oh, I mean, you have to ask him, right? <laughs> um, well, I, I've been asked this question several times. <laughs> um, and um, so what, I'm, what I talked about was non-invasive brain-computer interfacing. So you, you put on an EEG, which, you know, put, makes you put, you know, gel electrodes to your head. And that is, apart from a bit abrasing the skin of your head, very non-invasive. Um, what Elon Musk in his Neuralink um, um, example did was um, they um, tried to, to implant electrodes, which, which means it's, it's invasive, it's a brain surgery. And um, 
I mean, of course, if you have pigs, that's okay, right? Perhaps. Um, but the question is, and that's a medical question, is a brain surgery the right measure for a certain patient? And that's, this, is, this is a medical question. So do you, and, and, and so now assume that it would be, and I'm not sure whether a lot of people um, actually uh, think that way, uh, except for some very um, particular illnesses. So I think implanting um, on the other side is not something that, that has not been done before. Deep brain surgery or epilepsy surgery or um, um, cochlear implants. They, you know, people for, for do brain Parkinson. surgeries. Yeah, Sorry? Parkinson. For Parkinson. Yes, Parkinson. that's a deep brain simulation. Yeah. So, so there, there people do brain surgery and for good reasons. And, um, you know, they have a lot of experience. And people are typically sent home very quickly. So in deep brain simulation, I mean, my, my colleague at Mayo told me that, you know, on the next day you can go home if there are no problems. So if you have, there are problems, then, you know, you can't go home, it's clear. So the, I think the interesting thing that, that Elon Musk's team does um, is that they take very small electrodes. So the smaller the electrode, the less the reaction of the brain. And so usually if you take a thicker electrode, and thick means already small, <laughs> and the brain just gets rid of these electrodes by putting scar tissue around it, basically pushing it out of the brain. Mm -hmm. So that's the, after a while you don't measure anything anymore. The cool thing about the very thin electrodes is that this may not happen, right? Because the brain doesn't react so strongly. Also, the the um, the swelling may be less. So, but I think all these things are are you know very experimental, and um, you know perhaps um, they're well sold as well. <laughs> um, um, but. You know, just to be, to be, um, I think that generally what they do is, is very interesting. Um, and the, the reason is, um, if you <clears throat> do this kind of research with public uh, money, then, then you're, um, the grant agencies, if, you know, they, you know, have a different project officer or your colleagues don't like you anymore, then your money is stopped. So, which means that, you know, this is a long-term thing where you have to think about, you know, what are good electrodes? What is a good electron to transmit things out? What, is, what are actually good techniques to do, the, to do the surgery in the first place? What are the good application setups for this? This is a huge thing which requires different skills of a real big team. This can be done well in industry, um, you know, having, you know, the long in breadth of, of, of funding, ideally, <laughs> if they have it, right? Okay. Okay, uh, Klaus, that was the last question. So thank you very much for being today in this first edition of the National Colloquium for AI. So this is an effort, I remember everybody, from the Mexican Society for Artificial Intelligence, the Academy for Computer Science, and the Alliance for Artificial Intelligence. We had 125 uh, people watching the, the talk, so you are now very well known in Mexico, not just because <laughs> of your publications, but now because of your thought, and you are, you are uh, kindly invited uh, to visit Mexico in the next opportunity when okay. uh, things normalize. So thank you again very much, Klaus. It was really a very interesting talk that covered many topics, but uh, gives really an idea of how artificial intelligence is, is changing the world yes. and how artificial intelligence is becoming an engine for many applications so yes. thank and you to and everybody and who a tool for the sciences and, and, um, also, and I also think, good for the sciences yes, yes. I, I think 
um, you know, I thank you very much for for um, this kind invitation, and I hope, in the interest of all of us, that we go back to normal and that we all stay healthy. So, thank, thank you very much. Thank okay. you, Klaus. Bye, everybody. Bye bye.